must stand together. We can achieve that greater prosperity that will benefit all, not just a fortunate few. Winning the championship of growth and inclusive globalization requires teamwork and collaboration around the world. Please join me now in welcoming tonight's guests, Madam Christine Lagarde and Professors Nicholas Burns and Larry Summers. Doesn't that video make you all want to go to work for uh, the IMF? And one of the great privileges you would have if you went to work for the IMF was being led by my good friend, Christine Lagarde. Christine and I met first about a decade ago when she was the Minister of, fin Fra Minister of Finance of uh, France. She has had a truly extraordinary career. We at the Kennedy School like to talk about multi-sectoral uh, careers, and that is what Christine has lived. Graduating from school in France and also attending school in Washington, D.C., Christine was on the French synchronized swimming team and also graduated from law school. She went to work at Baker McKinsey, at that time, and I believe still today, the world's largest law firm and the world's most geographically diverse law firm. Many people went to work at that law firm. Very few became, several decades later, its leader. Christine Lagarde was the leader of the world's largest law firm and the first woman to lead the world's uh, largest law firm. Having led that law firm with great distinction, she entered politics in France in the middle of uh, the last decade, served in a number of um, ministries, made uh, great progress as a minister, starting with fisheries and ending with finance, which at least in my view constitutes uh, great uh, progress, and being the minister of trade uh, in between. As the minister of uh, finance, Christine shared key European financial groups and did much to set the stage for the 2011 summit, which did a great deal to organize the global financial recovery. It is a remarkable tribute uh, to Christine that when the IMF rather suddenly needed new leadership after a scandal, it would be normal to turn to someone from a different country than the country that had produced the scandal. But sometimes merit trumps normality. 
The world needed a person of extraordinary probity. It needed a person at a very tense time who would be a deft political leader. It needed someone who, at a moment of growing challenge to international, internationalism, would be an effective and charismatic communicator. And it needed someone who everyone would trust and respect. And there was one such person, and that was Christine Lagarde. And that's why she became the managing director of the IMF in uh, 2011. And that's why after IMF managing directors serve for uh, five years, but after about three and three quarters years, she was chosen to serve a second term and she has now embarked on that second term and the world is a better place uh, for it. I will only say one other thing about Madame uh, Lagarde. I had occasion a couple of years, two or three years ago, when the Greek controversy was at its um, boiling point, when it seemed like the European finance ministers were meeting every week to uh, yell at each other, to say to a friend of mine who was present for those meetings, I said, like, what's it like when this ECOFIN meets and deals with Greece? We Americans never get to be in the room. What's it like? And the response I got was very interesting and very revealing. They said, well, usually it's kind of like what you'd imagine a college debating society would be. There are a lot of people strutting and trying to show how clever they are and nobody's really trying to solve the problem and they're all just yelling at each other and seeing how late they can stay up and it's really very unproductive. And then sometimes the managing director of the IMF, Christine Lagarde, attends and then there's an adult in the room and they don't always find a solution but then they're kind of moving together with some sense of purpose. And that's what doesn't happen when she's not in the room and does happen when she is in the room. That's what international institution leadership uh, means. We are very fortunate to have had Christine Lagarde here all day at Harvard and to have had her participate in several classes and we are very fortunate that she has chosen this podium to present a set of remarks laying out the IMF's view of the world economy as the annual international financial meetings uh, are scheduled to take place early, uh, well actually late, uh, next uh, week. So let's all welcome Christine Lagarde. I don't know many people who could, in the course of one day, introduce you twice and change the narrative, <laughs> yet being loyal to the person he introduces. That's Larry. <laughs> so thank you so much for that generous introduction. Uh, Dean, dear Nick, dear friends, because I see quite a few of you in this room, um, and all of you attending this event, and giving up watching the Red Sox <laughs> win the game tonight, I hope. It's really delightful to be here with you. So I want to start with recognizing 
that we've just gone through a tough period of time. From the horrific tragedy in Las Vegas, the ongoing humanitarian crisis in Puerto Rico and other parts of the Caribbean, to the two successive earthquakes in Mexico City, it has been a difficult week. But coming here today and talking to some of the students, listening to them as well, is certainly rejuvenating and giving me confidence that we should have the ability together with your energy and your sense of public service to address some of the most difficult problems. So thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you for inviting me in early October and not in the middle of January. <laughs> and as I was walking through the beautiful lawns of your buildings, under refurbishing and reconstruction, I know that, but still beautiful, I was thinking of cycles, season cycles, the moon cycles. If there are any Chinese in the room, happy moon holiday. <laughs> and also the economic cycles. Now, a key challenge in economic cycles is trying to gain perspective on what comes next while you are in the midst of that cycle. So if we step back a bit, what might we see? Well, we would see that the long-awaited global recovery is taking hold, is taking roots. In July, the IMF projected a 3.5% global growth for 2017 and 3.6% global growth for 2018. And next week, as indicated by Professor Summers, we will be holding our annual meetings, and it may well be that this forecast will be a little bit better than that. That's good news number one. Good news number two, measured by uh, GDP, nearly 75% of the world is experiencing an upswing. It is the broadest based acceleration in a decade. And that means that there are more jobs, there are improving conditions in many places around the world. The not so good news though, is that the recovery is not complete. And some countries are growing way too slowly. We have at the moment more than 47 countries where growth is actually negative on a per capita basis. And for far too many people across all types of economies, low income, emerging, advanced economies, they're not still feeling the benefits of the recovery. Added to that, it has also exposed long running weaknesses in our ability to adapt to technological change and to global integration. And that persistent low growth in the decade since the global financial crisis has put a spotlight on the problem of excessive inequality. And as a result of that combined, our social fabric is fraying and many countries are experiencing increased political polarization here and there and beyond. So here is the question. Can the world seize the opportunity of this upswing of our economy to secure the recovery and create a more inclusive growth that actually works for all? Now, fortunately, I came to the Kennedy School of Government. And I found some inspiration from your namesake. I'll only abuse it twice, <laughs> I promise, because you've heard it many times over. Addressing Congress in 1962, about a year after the United States emerged from a recession, and that's the reason I've picked that particular quote. President Kennedy said, I quote, pleasant as it may be to bask in the warmth of recovery, the time to repair the roof is when the sun is shining. 
So let's just explore that idea. Now you would all agree that the sun is shining. It's been shining the whole day today. It was beautiful. But is it shining on the economy? Well, we have seen in most advanced economies a cyclical pickup in not just consumption, we had seen that, but in investment and trade. This is particularly the case in Europe and Japan and has led to better than expected growth. US forecast has been fluid in light of the economy's actual performance and changing prospects for tax reform. However, the likelihood for this year and the next is that growth will be above trend. Meanwhile, Asian emerging, emerging markets led by China and India have remained strong. And even in other emerging and developing economies, the outlook has become a bit brighter, including among commodity exporters in sub-Saharan Africa and in Latin America. Not quite the same story for the non-exporters of commodities and for those countries that have very limited resources. Financial conditions across economies have given borrowers new opportunities to fund investment and hopefully repair balance sheets. The most recent news that we heard from the ECB in particular is, in our view, quite fortunate. But there are clouds on the horizon, as we saw today. From high levels of debt in many countries to rapid credit expansion in China to excessive risk taking in financial markets, you have an idea of the kinds of clouds that we have on the horizon. And all of this comes against the background of heightened non-economic risks and challenges from weather-related disasters in the Caribbean and beyond to heightened geopolitical tensions, notably in the Korean Peninsula and in many other places, as my good friend Ash would attest. So yes, we are seeing some sun breakthrough, but it's not a clear sky. There are small clouds on the horizon and probably darker clouds beyond that, which is me referring to the medium term. So there are two possibilities to address the current situation. Either you sit back, you relax, you bask in the sun and in the warmth, and you wait for the next crisis to operate the changes which you know are necessary because you think to yourself, easier when there is a crisis looming. You know, I was a former finance minister. It is much easier to proceed that way. You become much more popular. Championing change, professor, as you indicated in your class this morning, is a difficult task particularly when things are getting better, particularly when people and countries and policymakers suffer from fatigue of having conducted programs of recovery after programs. But just because something is politically difficult does not mean that we should shy away from it. And again, I'm going to quote him. Remember what he said during the space race? I'm also referring to my son, who is desperately trying to get us out in space. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and to do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. But it is part of that spirit that should drive us to actually recommend, conduct, lead, and implement the changes which we believe are necessary. That second path, that better path, is actually to approach this moment as an opportunity to make the changes that will enable prosperity for the long run. And we believe that it is and the right thing and the right time to do so. Added to which IMF research has demo demonstrated that reforms are more potent and easier to implement when economies are healthier. My grandmother used to say, 
everything is better with butter. <laughs> she had gone through the Second World War and uh, there wasn't much butter around. But everything is better with growth, much easier. Look at just each and every issue. And intuitively, irrespective of what my grandmother used to say, it makes sense. It is less complicated to change intelligently a tax code when incomes are rising, or to update labor laws when an economy is getting close to full employment. So my key message is, we should not let a good recovery go to waste. Because we know what can happen if we let the mo moment pass. Eh, later on, growth will be too weak. Jobs will be too few. Safety nets will be unable to handle aging populations. Our financial system will be unprepared for future shocks. If we are not convinced, we need to just look back at what happened prior to the financial crisis. Boats were rising, situation was fine, and yet there were things that should have been done, that we should collectively have done at the time, that we didn't bother doing. Or to put it in Kennedy's terms, when the sun is shining, we must repair the roof. And how can we do that? What tools do we need to repair that roof, to make sure that growth, jobs, the financial system, the social safety net, the pension schemes, that all that works better and longer? I think we can start with fundamentals. Inflation, still too low and remarkably subdued despite near full employment in many advanced economies. That's a bit of a mystery. You know that Phillips curve that you've heard about? Hmm. Not quite what we would have expected. One of our chapters in the books that in the publications that will be released in a week's time actually explore that. So we take the view that monetary policy should continue to support the recovery. At the same time, easy financial conditions can create complacency in markets and a built up in vulnerabilities, including in particular private sector debt, which is another topic that we explore in our two soon to be published research papers. Central banks in our view should communicate their plans very clearly and execute monetary policy normalization smoothly as appropriate in each country. I'm not suggesting that the same monetary policies that had been applied by all key central banks in the last few years should continue as is. It is going to be country specific, it is going to be economy specific, and it will depend on the performance of those economies and the mission of their central bankers. But that imperative of communicating and telegraphing what is coming being attentive to the spillover impact of those decisions and the spillbacks into the domestic economies, that is a common factor to all of them. And it will help avoid market turbulence and a sudden tightening of financial conditions that could derail the recovery. Now, of course, and we have said that repeatedly and we will say it again, monetary policy is most effective when complemented with sound fiscal policies that promote long-term sustainable growth. Countries with healthier public finances, such as Germany, the Netherlands, Sweden, or Korea, can use this moment to invest more, including in particular in their own economies. And to those who say, well, the economies are doing fine, no investment is needed, I would challenge that. In all of those economies, actual investment is needed and would improve the productivity factors. In places where public debt, on the other hand, is too high, governments should use the opportunity of growth to reduce debt relative to GDP and strengthen their resilience. Containing public debt is also an imperative for many low-income countries where debt levels have risen markedly in recent years, including in those countries where debt had been uh, forgiven under the EPIC programs. 
reducing excessive global imbalances, which includes investing more where fiscal positions are healthy and lowering deficit elsewhere, can actually support growth and avoid financial and exchange rate instability, which ultimately will be good for all of those countries, including those in surplus. At the same time, we know that monetary and fiscal tools can only take us so far. And we keep talking about the three-pronged approach. We need the whole toolkit, including the structural reforms to fully repair the roof. Now, I know, structural reforms. We always talk about structural reforms. What is it? Well, that's where the toolkit uh, is not exactly helpful. Because for each and every economy, it is going to take different forms, and it is going to require different approaches. In one country, it will be the labor market, which has not been sufficiently reformed or deeply reformed. It might be the unemployment benefit system. It would, might be the labor <coughs> active uh, policies to help people get to the job market. In other countries, it might be a service industry. It's going to vary for each and every country. And I would suggest that the first approach is to lift incomes and create jobs. That should be the imperative and the objective for those structural reforms. The second recommendation would be to invest in people's futures and fostering inclusive growth. So in the largest economies, overall product productivity growth has been lagging. And it has dropped to about 0.3% down from pre-crisis average of about 1%. That means that despite technological advances, wages in many places are only inching up. Boosting productivity, a factor of lifting wages, requires, among other things, cutting red tape, increasing spending on research and development, and investing in infrastructure. In some countries, wages are being limited by weak demand reflected in still too high unemployment or involuntary part-time unemployment. So increasing demand can help lead to higher wages. Again, that's a full chapter that will come to publication next week, which is fascinating. We also need to look at ways to create new jobs. And this is where labor market reform comes in. Have policies worked around the world? Well, that's what we examine. There are different policies for different places. In Spain, for instance, the labor market reforms has actually led both employers and employees to give up some workplace flexibility. In Mexico, revised rules allow young people to more easily enter the formal job market and gain access to health care and other benefits. In Japan, childcare leave benefits were expanded from 50 to 67 percent in sa of salary as part of a larger effort to get an additional one million women to the job market. By the way, and those of you who know me well, making sure that women can contribute to the economy, empowering them, giving them access to finance, is just a no-brainer from an economic point of view. Yeah. And although it's fairly artificial, because it's only based on speculations and modelization in many ways, but if there was similar access of to the market for both men and women, GDP in the US would be up by 5%. Not much, but not bad either. <laughs> and in Egypt, up by 37%, sorry, 34%. As I said, each and every country will have its own approach and its own prescriptions, and will have to have ownership of those measures. All this brings me to my second area of focus, investing in people's future. <coughs> Over the past three decades, economic inequality between countries, between countries has declined sharply, led by the rise of emerging markets such as China in particular and India to a lesser extent. But if we look at inequality within countries, especially some advanced economies, we see widening gaps and an increased concentration of wealth 
among the top uh, earners. IMF research has shown that excessive inequality hinders growth and hollows out a country's economic foundation. It erodes trust within society and fuels political tensions. And we know that inequality is often cemented through disparities in school and access to healthcare. Now, the good news is that many countries are working to change that narrative. In India, healthcare access has been expanded with clear benefits for the poorest citizens. In South Korea, bonuses are being offered to encourage teachers to work in underperforming schools. And in the US, more is being done to increase the number of women studying science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. More needs to be done. Now, 13 years ago, on this campus, a young man invented a social media platform that would connect the world. But you know what? The next Mark Zuckerberg need not come from Harvard. He might, granted. <laughs> he might. But with the right investment in education, she could come from the south side of Chicago or from Sri Lanka, or from Senegal. This is not it. We see the world change. And this long life cycle, education and training, talked about, is something that we will see and that we will participate and should participate in. Germany's apprenticeship program, much talked about, has served as a model for decade, decades. And a recent Canadian initiative showed that on-the-job skills training can be more effective than classroom learning. If you decide to do lifelong cycle learning in Singapore, you automatically have access to a lifelong grant. Just an idea. This moment also calls on us to prepare the future of work. The rise of automation could exacerbate inequality as owners of technology gain efficiency, but lower skilled works lose jobs. At the IMF, we're looking at the pros and cons of idea that might help. From unorthodox concepts like universal basic income, to mainstream policies such as more progressive taxation. In 1981, the average top marginal tax rate in advanced economies was 62%. In 2015, it was 35%. Am I advocating that we go back to the 62%? No. But new IMF research, which will be released next week, suggests that some advanced economies could raise their top tax rates without slowing growth. Worth considering. These ideas can support our efforts to repair the roof. And yet there is one more tool that I have not touched yet, and that will close my remarks. Many of the challenges that I have referred to require not just domestic solutions, they must be country tailored. Some of them must be region tailored. But most of them require global approaches and cooperation. Think about corruption, where the IMF recently committed to do more to help its members. Bribery alone cost more than $1.5 trillion. That is 2% of GDP. Then there is embezzlement, there is corporate income tax evasion, not just tax optimization, evasion, money laundering, terrorist financing, all problems that have cross-border dimensions and that can leverage technology. Or consider financial regulation. The Financial Safety Board and other institutions have made significant progress since the crisis to strengthen the safety of the global financial system, especially through higher levels of bank capital and liquidity and mechanisms to actually resolve banks. While yes, 
some of those regulations require some review, and yes, there might be fi fine tuning, and there might be adjustments required for smaller banks. Yet, we must make every effort to keep the safety and the sanity that have been put in place as a result of these global mechanisms and rules. Cooperation on all these challenges can help rebuild trust with skeptical citizens, especially if we prove that cooperation translates into more jobs and a brighter future. Look at trade, for example. Over the last 30 years, trade has raised global growth and lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. And yet, many people have the perception that trade is associated with destructions of jobs, with disruption of territories, and that effectively trade has not really impacted positively our societies. Well, while protectionist policies are counterproductive, Steps can certainly be taken to improve the system, to increase transparency, and to make trade work for all. One final example where cooperation is needed. So corruption, financial regulation, trade are three key ones. Let me add a fourth one, which is, in our view, critical, and that is climate change. A threat to every economy and every citizen, differently impacted depending on where you live what geography you benefit from or suffer from. Our estimates suggest that an, a one degree Celsius increase in a country with an average annual temperature of 25 degrees, that would be Bangladesh, by the way, could reduce per capita GDP by nearly 1.5%. But Bangladesh and similarly situated countries cannot meet those challenges by themselves. Only international cooperation can stem the man-made causes of global warming. And that, again, is a fascinating study that we will be releasing next week, where we see that the impact on climate change will result from cooperation because those suffering from it most have not much to do with it, and those suffering less have caused most of it. So what is the bottom line? Policymakers should use all tools at their disposal to act now and take advantage of this period of global growth. As I said, let us not let a good recovery go to waste. And in our view, cooperation remains the best way to create a more prosperous future for every nation. It's not going to suffice. We will still require domestic action and policies at national levels. But I believe that the IMF can serve as a platform for dialogue and a resource for countries seeking to build more resilient economies. So we are part of the toolkit. We are one of the few forums where people should have not only their vested interests at heart, but also the collective good. That is a message that I try to underscore with the membership, 189 of them, from the biggest to the smallest. So I started my remark by mentioning my walk through the campus and how it sparked my thinking. Well, I'm certainly not the first French citizen to find a little wisdom in New England. In fact, one of my favorite writers, the one that I read back in 1972, before I came for the first time to this country, was Alexis de Tocqueville, De la démocratie en Amérique, and a few others. I think he would quite enjoy the town hall forum that you have created here at Harvard. He once wrote, what is not yet done is only what we have not yet attempted to do. Now, Napoleon perfected that a few years later by saying that impossible, of course, is not French. Ah. Well, let us draw inspiration from the words of Tocqueville, as well as from the enduring message of President Kennedy, and use the season of transformation to actually repair the roof while the sun is shining. Thank you very much.
thank you, Madame Lagarde. Christine, thank you very much for that very thoughtful and important speech for next week's annual meetings. I'm Nick Burns, a professor here at the Kennedy School. I'm very pleased to be co-moderating this session with my friend, Professor Larry Summers. Larry and I share, uh, in some circles, a radical belief, and that is that the type of economic diplomacy that you just witnessed and the type of diplomacy that Christine has practiced for many years is as important to our country as well as all other countries as arms control, border disputes, or the endless political debates that we witness at the United Nations. I say that as a non-economist. I say that as a former diplomat, that economics is the enabling power that those of us, like our great friend Ash Carter, who's come back to Harvard after being a very successful Secretary of Defense, Ash couldn't have had and sustained the great military without a sound American economy. And we in the State Department couldn't practice traditional diplomacy successfully. So for that reason, we're combining our two programs into a program of economic diplomacy from the Musavar Rahmani Center that Larry and John Haig direct to the Future of Diplomacy Project that we're involved with at the Belfer Center. Christine's our very first visitor. We have Penny Pritzker coming in two and a half weeks and then Mike Froman. Of course, Mike Froman of the late great Trans-Pacific Partnership and the US-EU <laughs> Free Trade Agreement. And our hope is that our students are gonna be inspired by the wisdom and the careers of people like Christine. So let us thank her again for being here. So we thought we would um, take the prerogative of the co-chairs and each ask maybe a question or two very briefly of Christine. Then we'll go to you, the audience. I'll give you some instructions as to where the microphones are. And Christine, I listened very carefully to the end of your speech, your whole speech, but I was struck by the end of the speech where you talk about the importance of corruption, of fighting corruption, of climate change, of the future of work, of the empowerment of women I don't think I can imagine an IMF managing director of 20 or 30 or 40 years ago who would have said to this audience that in addition to the core mission of the first part of the speech, this for you is part of a 21st century agenda. I just wanted to know if you agree with that and maybe embellish that a little bit. Well, Nick, I, uh, number one, I don't want to be dismissive to any of my predecessors and colleagues. Um, and yet I think that you are probably true uh, or you're probably correct, because some of those issues were not as um, obvious uh, or as uh, critical as they are today. Uh, and I'm, I'm hesitating between obvi obvious and critical, because I believe that of all those that you've mentioned, uh, climate change, corruption, the empowerment of women and inequalities, um, I think most of them were there, probably not as visible, and it may well be that the last uh, 10 years of low growth and, and uh, uh, difficult economic circumstances have brought that to the fore and made them more, uh, more, more, more difficult and, and all of us more attentive to them. I also think that um, the, institution, the, the IMF, um, to coin an expression by um, Larry, it's mostly fiscal, has evolved a little bit over the course of time and I hope to have helped a bit with that. Um, to suggest that it has been easy all the time and that it is anchored and definitely where it is and where it should be going forward, I'm not sure. <laughs> because, you know, it's in a way it's far more comfortable to look at issues and to look at monetary policy, fiscal policy, a bit of macro prudential at the margin and structural reforms to the extent that it impacts on financial stability and, and growth in general. And not to pay too much attention to other topics and not to really ask the question of whether it is macro critical, whether it is going to have a significant impact on, on those economies uh, in and of themselves and globally. So I think we have done that collectively at the, f at the IMF, and uh, I think it, it was the right thing to do, and we will continue doing so, in spite of some conservatism now and again about those emerging issues. I personally don't think that they are, they are, they are emerging. I think they're more visible now, but they, they have 
been there for a long time. And other economists as wise as Larry could have a view on that as well. I don't know if you agree with me. I agree with you, uh, I agree with you on that, but I'm going to bring you back to more conventional economics, <laughs> uh, if I could, uh, for, for just a second. The recurring theme in your speech was um, we've got a really good recovery and we need to not waste it and we need to take advantage of it to do things. And maybe we do have a really good uh, recovery, but at least a question that many people might have would be this. Um, every, central, every major central bank in the industrialized world has an inflation target of 2%. It's kind of easy to measure what markets think inflation's going to be. And they think it's going to be pretty far short of 2%, more or less everywhere. It's pretty easy, you know, expected inflation. You can look at index bonds and look at nominal bonds. And, you know, it's sort of 1.5% for 30 years in the United States. And it's much lower than that in uh, Europe and in uh, Japan. If you look at the real interest rate, which people think has got something to do with the demand for investment and the supply of savings, it kind of looks like there's going to be a lot of savings and not much investment because it's kind of pretty close to zero on a global average basis. So at least the bond markets seem to be saying, how long is this recovery really going to run? Maybe we need to put the pedal to the metal and get on the accelerator harder. And I'm a little confused about where the IMF is. Is the IMF on, well, you know, this is the moment for central banks to reduce their balance sheets because they've gotten really big and now we have a recovery and this is the moment for governments other than Germany and the Netherlands to have fiscal consolidation um, because we don't want to overheat? or is this the moment when the IMF wants us not to be complacent and assume that the recovery is to be taken for granted and keep the pedal to the metal um, with macroeconomic policies so that uh, this recovery for sure stays uh, strong? And I'm a little unclear um, kind of where the IMF is on that sort of large, sort of on that large scale issue? Yeah, more the latter than the, um, than the former, uh, Larry, which I maybe I wasn't clear enough. So I'll, uh, did you give me a chance to clarify. On the monetary policy front, what we're saying is that in, if we take the big, the big ones, the Fed, the ECB, Bank of Japan, Bank of England, apart from the Fed, which very gradually, slowly, wisely, telegra well telegraphically has begun withdrawing from the accommodative monetary policy and has begun to slightly raise the rate. And we believe that this is appropriate in view of what's happening on the employment market and to a certain degree on the inflation front, which at least for the short term is closer to two than the longer term based on the expectations that we, we can foresee. But apart from that one, we support continued accommodative monetary policy out of the other ones. I think the case of the Bank of England, you know, I don't want to be too specific about the circumstances there because it's in flux because of the Brexit situation. But certainly as far as the ECB is concerned and the Bank of Japan is concerned, we support continued accommodative monetary policy. Um, that's number one. Number two, our fiscal message is, is subtle. Uh, we are saying that those, those countries that are in clear uh, surplus or close to surplus should definitely take advantage of that to invest and to use their fiscal space. Even though for some of them, the output gap is virtually closed or already closed. And those economies might take the risk of a little overheating if need be, and certainly have areas where they can invest and improve their factors of productivity. In other countries, that's where it's, it's a little bit more tricky. Because for those economies where 
uh, the the debt direction is clearly up and and in in very high territories. We believe that it's not time to have any fiscal expansion, and it's time to if at least stabilize and try to reduce their deficit in order to address the excessive debt issue that they have. Having said that, they can also make sure that um, their policy in terms of fiscal space is growth friendly. So for all of them, they should have a growth friendly fiscal policy. So Those, yeah. So recognize, I can't resist. So <laughs> recognizing that um, a tax reform that reform the tax system in directions that would promote growth is good in the yeah. United States. Yeah. And recognizing that more public investment is good. Um, what would the IMF view be of the prudence of a combined set of tax measures that um, would raise projected budget deficits over 10 years by, just to pick some numbers that I heard somewhere, one and a half to $2.2 trillion. Would, would the IMF think that such tax, such deficit increasing tax cuts were well or poorly advised for the IMF, for the United States? Well, in that sort of dystopia country of, of yours, um, <laughs> a tax reform that would significantly increase the deficit uh, now and in the foreseeable future given the um, coming up liabilities in that country in three, four, five years, we would not think that it is particularly advisable. And Which doesn't mean to say that no tax reform is needed in that dystopia country of yours. Uh, quite to the contrary, we believe that a good tax reform is but absolutely needed and has been needed for a long time. But a deficit enhancing tax reform would be problematic in Correct. your view, particularly. Like, and just to make sure I understood one other thing uh, you said. Um, you cited uh, IMF research, which I'm familiar with and I'm inclined to find persuasive, um, suggesting that there would be no ill effect from raising top tax rates substantially back from their current level. But not uh, to the 62% Not to the 62 but substantially up. Would I be right to think that if you think there's no adverse effect on growth, then it would probably be logical to assume that you regarded the view that cutting taxes at the top would stimulate so much growth that it would pay for itself in terms of reduced deficits that you'd probably kind of regard that as nonsense. I mean, if, if tax rates don't affect growth at all, then it's kind of hard to see how cutting tax rates could pay for itself. Well, because I don't have enough details yet about that tax reform in your dystopia country of yours, I'm not going to pass judgment on that. <laughs> Extraordinarily diplomatic yeah. in the way that I described. And Larry, because we're not trying to get her into trouble tonight, I'm going to, uh, we're going to go to student questions in a minute, but I wanted to bring you back, Christine, to what was explicit in your speech, and that's a focus on inequality, implicit in the speech, and that is that globalization's under attack. I know you've yeah. spoken Larry's class this morning on globalization, but if you look at the Brexit vote, the Trump phenomenon in 2016, even the recent German elections, concern over refugees, immigration, inequality, how do political leaders and managing directors of the IMF, how do we all, speak to the public about the need for some global and multilateral institutions to knit the world together to confront climate change and trafficking of human beings and drug and crime cartels and fight corruption. It doesn't happen just because national governments want it to happen. You, just, you need organizations like yours. How do you speak about that when you're out talking to people? First of all, I think that we, we need to speak the truth and we need to explain what our findings are. And we need to distinguish between what is a result of international trade, what is a result of transformation of technology, uh, what is attributable to uh, corruption, how we can uh, address all these issues. And to actually have this sort of baggage word called globalization 
is, is deceptive and has certainly led a lot of people to attribute to globalization all the hardship that they go through. I think that's number one. Speak the truth, analyze exactly what the connections are and what, uh, the, uh, what leads to what. That's number one. Number two, equally if not more important, uh, we collectively, and when I say we, it's not an international institution like the IMF, or it's not just policymakers, it's also educational institutions, it's also uh, non-governmental organizations, it's all of us collectively. We need to anticipate and we need to see who is taking a hit, who is suffering and what can be done about it. Because yes, there are regions, there are parts of the world where it's hurting where people don't have a job, where people don't have hope, where people feel that they've lost their dignity, and where policies need to be uh, implemented, where the whole system needs to focus and to try to help. Now that's looking at consequences of the past that we have not focused on. I'm more concerned about another one which is coming down the road, which is the impact of technologies and the compounded effect of technologies coming together, where more and more people, not just in some scattered region, not some in certain set of skills, not, some, not in some countries, but where people across will feel disenfranchised, will feel excluded, will feel uh, left out. And you know, there was a fascinating piece in one of the uh, Orange newspapers today. Um, about the, the Uber drivers around the world and how they feel that they are transformed, I as transformed into androids. Because their driving directions, approaches, pick up, turn right, turn left, is entirely determined outside their own will and determination. That's only a little thing. And down the road, there will be much more of that. So we need to prepare for that so that those who feel excluded by international trade today and who feel that trade doesn't work for them do not feel in two, three, four, five, ten years' time that technologies no longer work for them either. And they've lost their autonomy, their dignity, their sense of having a direction and a destiny. So I, I think we need to anticipate that and educational institutions have a huge responsibility in that respect. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks. Thanks for answering our questions. Now we have a tradition here that students and our guests have a right to ask questions. We have two mics on the floor. We have two mics in the first balcony. Um, just a few rules. Please let us, let us know your name, what you're studying here if you're a student. Please be brief. Please make sure that at the end of your question, there's a question mark actually attached to it. Uh, and we'll try to get as many questions in as we can before we have to retire. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Henry. I'm a junior at the college studying math. And my question is, how do you see the economy changing with the rise of cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin? And what role should the IMF play, if any? Ah. <laughs> You know, it's, it's a difficult question uh, because, you know, these cryptocurrencies, whether they're called Bitcoins, Iridium, Iridiums or others, are clearly in the process of development at the moment. And uh, they are supported by a technology which, in not only my view, the view of the IMF, but the view of many of the financial institutions at the moment, uh, the distributed ledger technology will be used to actually uh, conduct, drive, support transaction in a much safer, more efficient, and more anonymous way, which can have huge benefits, which can shorten speed and, 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 and better guarantee the protection of those conducting those transactions. And that is the good side of it. <coughs> There's another darker side of it, which clearly has been picked up by the Chinese authorities lately, uh, which had to do with this Ponzi-like scheme which was put in place on the occasion of this initial coins offering, uh, which clearly have to be under control, regulated, scrutinized, and you know, um, fraud be avoided by the supervisors and the regulators. But I would suggest that you know, this, is, this is a moving um, 
moment, n not a moving moment. It's uh, the moving components to that whole debate uh, between the distributed ledger technologies, uh, the definition of monetary policies, uh, the fate of an international currency like the special drawing rights, which I have floated and flagged uh, about a week ago in London, which we are going to further explore. But I think we should be prepared for significant changes going forward. Uh, there were days when nobody believed in the banknotes, in the paper money, and where, you know, when, when countries moved to the assignat uh, in my country, it was, it was just totally disregarded and considered as, as uh, uh, monkey money. But that has massively changed in a, in a matter of decades. I think there is an acceleration process that is uh, in play at the moment. But I equally think that we should be super careful and not just jump to the latest fad, assuming that this is going to be uh, the, the currency of the future. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hello. Um, hello. I'm Akinwande Lalude. I'm in the MPID program here at the Kennedy School. I'm in my second year. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, female leadership. There, there was an article in the Harvard Business Review last year that was talking to law firms about how they pick their next generation. And the law firms that pick uh, men from tier one schools were picking women from tier two schools with the idea that women from tier two schools might be better performers than women from tier one schools. And to, in, a, in kind of a broader sense, it could be that women who come from less traditional backgrounds might be better suited as leaders. And I was just going to ask you, what did you think about that? One, I haven't read the article, and I'm a bit dis disconnected from the, from the, the law firm world uh, nowadays. But I think what you're touching on is the issue of um, recruiting, origin of uh, the um, the staff, the talent, the associates that uh, institutions or firms recruit, and whether coming from a top tier uh, school universities uh, is sufficient passport to get to the top jobs. And my response to you is no, it is not any longer. That's my, my very strong belief. Um, because I believe in diverse employment, in diverse workforce, and because I believe that being trained in the same format, in the same mold, and, and with the same sort of clonic, as well as clanic environment is not necessarily conducive to leadership. Uh, so I, I would certainly not turn my nose up to second or third tier um, educational background uh, for the sake of selecting only the first tier background. I think that talents have to be measured against merits and against a track record and against opening of mind, willingness to work, willingness to lead, willingness to take <coughs> risk, willingness to have courage. That's my take on leadership. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Amin Gulamali and I'm a student at Harvard College. My question is about the impact of technology on global growth, specifically on service-based jobs. Machine learning and AI threaten to take away a lot of service-based jobs like driving for Uber or uh, for trucking, which takes up a million or a million and a half jobs in the United States. Um, do you think that there will ever come a time when the IMF will have to advocate for a universal basic income because <laughs> of that? And um, how will that lead to more antagonisms um, against protection for protectionist policies against uh, global integration, specifically with trade, and the view that trade's a zero-sum game. Mm. You're putting so many things <laughs> together. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, one, on, on, on the universal basic income, uh, we are publishing next week, the Fiscal Affairs Department of the IMF is publishing a really interesting study. And the IMF is not taking a view that UBI is the thing to do or is not the thing to do. And we're trying to identify in view of what is happening on the job market and the transformation of work and the space that is being taken over by the combination of uh, you know, data mining, artificial intelligence and, and those technologies that we referred to, with that as the background, where jobs will be transformed massively, 
we are looking at this universal basic income and the circumstances, conditions under which it would eventually make sense. So uh, just to put it squarely on the table, we're not saying it's good or it's not good. We're saying there are circumstances where it should be considered and could be considered. You know, it's a debate that has been going on for a long time, uh, which is, um, I mean, you can find people on, on both sides of the arguments from completely different backgrounds and sometimes different ideologies as well. Um, but the, the, the value of this study is to, re to look at the conditions under which it could very well be appropriate and a more efficient um, way of transferring um, support and benefits to people than sometimes targeted programs. Okay, so that's for UBI. The other questions that you raise are, are just huge. And, you know, forgive me if I speak as not necessarily the managing director of the IMF, but a, reform, a former and a reformed lawyer who specialized in antitrust issues. I believe that uh, antitrust competition law uh, is in serious need of massive overall review and transformation because of what you said, because of the services uh, penetration of all our economies, because of the intangibility of so many of the economic uh, values and creations that abound at the moment. Look just at, at, at the value developed by um, one of those, the, one of the GAFAs, as they're called. I don't know if it's called GAFA here in France, but anyway, G stands for Google, A for Ma Amazon, and, and F for Facebook, and I think the last A is probably <coughs> Alibaba. Think about the value that they produce, their market cap, and think about where they start from, what is the raw material that they use and how they get it. Think about the market share that they drive and expand. Antitrust and competition laws have to evolve as a result of that. And you know the, the thinking, the rational, the mechanisms that we used to use no longer apply to those. And, and, and that's a fantastic field for maybe for, for here, Harvard, because I suppose that if you combine the excellence of, of some of your best lawyers and the excellence of some of your best economists, uh, you can arrive at redefinition, uh, a redefinition of those, those fields. Thank you. Yes. Hi, thank you for joining us today. Um, it's really a pleasure that you are able to spend the evening with us. Thank you. My name is Ina Agarwal. I'm a first year MPA student. My question has to do with the birth of the women's empowerment movement, which was rooted in the principle of transforming gender subordination, breaking down oppressive structures, and creating this potential for political movement. As we've moved towards the Western definition of the woman and of the girl, um, which perhaps risks us to victimize and uh, diminish their role in society, um, where we seek technical solutions towards healthcare and education and economic and financial access to financial tools, how do we transcend this myopic and rigid definition? of women's empowerment, um, which is, I think, largely conceived as women's economic empowerment today. So how would you define it, if it was properly defined? I think that there is a large space, space that is unquantifiable, at least in our current world, around cultural contribution, societal contribution, beyond space in the workforce, religious contribution, um, that is very hard to tangibly quantify. And I don't mean to imp undermine the value that women's economic empowerment has to the role of women's empowerment, but how do we move back to uh, political mobilization as a, a key tenant of women's empowerment? And Well, political sure. mobilization is going to be your responsibility. <laughs> and I'm sure that you will, you will take it up. I'll tell you something. Be because of the amount of progress that is needed, because of the, the, the size of the gap that we see, I am very interested in making sure that we can quantify the gains out of women economic empowerment. 
which is a combination of access to the workplace, dealing with health issues, appropriate parental leave, uh, access to finance, elimination of legal discriminations that abound in about 90% of the countries in the membership of the IMF. Because if we can quantify it, then it makes the case much more convincing for those, and there are still a few of those, who have just zero interest in that particular matter, who are actually terribly bored when they hear those noises. <laughs> but not so bored when you say, actually, it can increase GDP, it can improve the bottom line, and it's going to be a much, much more efficient result and outcome for you, even from your narrow-minded perspective. <laughs> so I would continue to fight for that for myself, and I trust you will continue for the rest as well. Thank you. Good. Um, yes, sir. Okay. Thanks a lot for being here and for, for your time. I'm Giovanni Fassi. I'm a first-year MBA student. And uh, yesterday I attended a speech by Mr. Romano Prodi that was here, it was a previous uh, European Commission president. And he said that we live in a time, we, you were talking about the, the shining time. Uh, we have uh, the sun and so on, but he said that actually we live in a time in which we have a lot of authoritarian movement. We see in US, we have seen in Spain, we have seen in Germany with us election, we have seen in other countries and in Italy in the next election. So he said all the government now, the local government, do not have the time to think long term. Mm. They can only think of action on a really short term basis and all their idea to reduce surplus for Germany will be seen really bad by their country. So my question is how the supranational institution like IMF, ECB should enforce or if they have to enforce new policies to support the local countries in doing these reforms because they don't have the possibility to do this alone. You know, I'm not, I'm not surprised, he's surprised that he's making this argument, and he's, he's right. I was a politician for uh, a short span of in my life, six years, and it is true that your um, temporal horizon is very short and very limited. Um, if, you, if you're a civil servant, if you serve the administration, it's a different story. <coughs> but if you're elected, or if you're appointed for as long as, uh, your president or your prime minister is in position, it's a short period of time, and not one when you can actually effect changes. Uh, my humble view being that you can actually determine, rally support around that determination, then implement and make sure that it, 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 it sticks. It takes about five years. That's the minimum period of time. There are not many governments that have a, a, a life of five years. So that's a, a really big issue, where you have a conflict between the length of time it takes to reform and implement the reform, and the length of time you have on your on you shelf uh, as, as a politician. So the only thing we can do, because we cannot enforce things, uh, we only have traction in case when we design a program with a country and we actually have the, the carrot of the disbursement of, of funds. But in all other circumstances, we cannot enforce. We can recommend, we can model, we can give best practices, we can try to simulate what the consequences of such policy rather than such other policy will be. Uh, we can refer to 70 years of past experience uh, for ourselves. Um, and and we, can, we, can, we can plead, we can cajole, uh, we can encourage, uh, but that's, that's all we can do. And, uh, and, and, and then it's up to the, the courage of the leaders to actually ignore that threat that is hanging over their horizon of the next term election to the benefit of what is the right policy for my country and the welfare of my people and beyond. That's another more difficult thing too, which is the subject of the surplus. Country with just closed the output gap, which is running this big surplus. You can sing or belly dance as long as you want, that it's going to be helpful for the community. If you're a politician back at home, that's not very convincing because the community out there is not going to vote for you. So you, you need to find that common denominator that is going to help the overall community and what it will contribute to the domestic forum 
in which those policymakers will be elected. So we're supposed to have finished by now, um, but there's so many students that want to ask a question. We'll try to get in a couple of more. We're going to go into extra innings. Is that okay with you? Extra yeah. innings? That's a baseball and term, right? That's exactly right. <laughs> And if it, very good. And if anybody has a Red Sox score, just signal us. They should be through right from right now. But we'll go to this question right here. Thank you, thank you so much, and thank you for your time, Madam Lagarde. Uh, my name is Ted Wechter. I'm a senior at the college. And in your speech, and actually in this last question, you've talked about policies that countries should consider or that you'll plead with them to consider. But in a lot of countries, the IMF uses um, conditional lending to impose structural adjustment and austerity programs regardless, and especially countries in the Global South, regardless of whether those people want them. And what that means is that in, you know, for example, Zambia, you could have a democratic election, the government is thrown out, and actually the economic and fiscal policy isn't gonna change at all because it's not being made in Lusaka, it's being made in your office at an institution that's unaccountable to people in Zambia or anywhere else, um, in what some might call a metropole in Washington, D.C. So is this kind of undemocratic imposition of policy, isn't it unfair, isn't it neocolonial? And wouldn't you say it actually undermines confidence in, the de in democracy and in the international cooperation that you say is so vital to economic growth in the coming decades? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, because what you have just described will never work. In other words, those reforms, those conditionalities that you referred to, if they are cooked in my office, as you say, ignoring the Zambia government and without any regard to the Zambian population and without any care for the ownership of that program back at home, it will fail, okay? And the way in which we are trying to work, it's not perfect, but that's the way we're trying to work now, is to make sure that we have in place conditions Always difficult, because if it was easy, the IMF wouldn't be there. We are only called upon to operate because the situation is extremely difficult, because the local governments or the policymakers have not had the courage to make the right decisions in due course, because they did not manage public funding as they should have, because they let things happen that completely damaged the economic <coughs> situation of the country. So if it wasn't difficult, we wouldn't be there. And it is because those measures are difficult that they need to be adopted, endorsed, and owned by the authorities, communicated to the people. I'll give you an example. I'll give you the example of Egypt. I don't know if there are any Egyptians in the room here. You are. <laughs> it took us quite a lot of time to actually be able to agree a program with the Egyptian authorities because it was necessary that the Egyptian authorities, from the highest level to the central bank governor's level to the civil society levels as well, could actually understand the value, the direction, and the worthiness of this program. When you decide to depeg the currency and to float the currency in order to avoid that the, the central bank waste the reserves of the country, it has to be decided by the authorities themselves. As I said, I can sing and, and belly dance as long as, as you want. If I'm the only one to believe that, it's not going to work. So in the case of Egypt, we finally, we finally reached agreement and the authorities own that process. They own the determination to remove the subsidies on fuel that were not targeted. They own the decision of having depegged and having floated the currency, and as a result, having generated some inflation that will ultimately go down. It is difficult. All these decisions are really difficult, and they are risky in many ways. But there are the solutions to actually restore a situation that, that was totally out of control. Now, an interesting example that I mentioned to one of the classes that I taught this morning with, uh, with your professor is, in the case of Egypt, we paid attention to the safety net, to the social safety net that people needed. And there were subsidies that we said shouldn't be touched. And we agreed with the authorities. And we also said, what about women participation in the economy? Based on our study, you could improve the GDP of Egypt by 34% if women had equal access as men 
to the economy. And we actually designed, in agreement with the authorities, elements of the budget that would actually help and protect women to go to work, and that would help them with uh, birth, uh, with uh, childcare centers. So we're trying to be mindful as well, but it's never going to work it's, uh, if it's not owned and, and, and <coughs> designed by the authorities. Not pleasant, not easy, courageous decisions, but that, that's the only way it can work. Thank you. With apologies to all the students waiting, uh, we have time for just a quick question and a quick answer, and then we have to leave. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Judy Payen. I'm also a first year um, MBA student at HBS across the river. I'll make this question very quick. Um, you yourself and a couple of the people who've asked questions have referenced the fact that quite often governments have quite a short horizon and therefore that can influence their ability to actually implement policies that are good over the long term. Um, coming from a business background, I'm curious as to what your views are on the role of business in solving these issues, your interactions with businesses, thinking about social enterprise, impact investing, and the scope that they have for actually pushing forward a lot of these things that you referenced, rather than focusing on this, the disruption they're causing, maybe the, the scope there is for actually creating quite a lot of good. Gosh, you're talking so fast, I'm not sure that I understood, because he said short question, but you had this big question, so you put all the words in. Oh, sorry. It's, it, your concern is, what is the role of, of the business community? Was it, what is the role of the private sector? Just that I feel like a lot of the conversations around business so far and the questions yeah. have focused on the disruption that it's caused to communities and countries, but I feel like that we're not focusing enough on the good that it can do, thinking about impact investing, social enterprise, and I just wanted to get your view on the role they play, the role the IMF plays in interacting with business more than governments, perhaps. You know, one of, one of the key conditions for, for business to be interested in investing, whether it's, it's development of existing investment locally or whether it's foreign direct investment into a country, whether it's, uh, you know, um, participating in the privatization that is sometimes decided on the occasion of, the, of those programs, what's critically important is macroeconomic stability. So when we try to procure that to a country, and to give investors some stability and some horizon in terms of taxation, in terms of uh, revenue collections, in terms of general vis business environment and friendliness of it all, we are trying to participate in their success, which is conducive to jobs and, and, and development of activity and innovation and hopefully productivity and, 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 and trade. I mean, they are integral, quintessential uh, players in, in these economic developments. I hope you know, I did not convey anything that would uh, go to the contrary. I was in the private sector for 25 years of my productive life. But. Thank you for your questions, and please join us in thanking Christine Lagarde. <laughs>